Hello, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt here for ACC.org at ESC 2022 in Barcelona, in very sunny Barcelona. And it has been amazing to be at a live international meeting again. For myself, at least, this is the first time since the pandemic. So personally, I've been super excited and it's just great seeing friends and hearing things live and all the exciting new data here has just been quite energizing. I'm really fortunate to be joined by two good friends and colleagues, Professor Gabriel Stegg from the University of Paris and someone that I've worked with quite closely when she was at Brigham and Harvard, uh, Pyle Foley. Uh, really wonderful to have you both. Hello. Great to be here. So let's go ahead and get started. There are a lot of good trials on day one, but uh, just for the sake of time, let's cover four of them. And maybe Gabriel, I'll start with you with the SECURE trial. Just in a nutshell, can you tell the audience what it was, what it found, and what do you think? Yes, uh, I should disclose I was involved, and I guess you were too. So it's a it's a trial that looked at- Well, don't prevention. worry, Paul will keep us honest. <laughs> I'll try my yes. best. <laughs> It's a trial that looked at the use of a polypill for cardiovascular prevention after MI in patients above 65 years of age and with additional features of higher risk. And the, the polypill was a combination of aspirin 100, erovastatin 20 to 40 milligrams, and ramipril 2.5, 5 or 10. There were various iterations of the polypill according to tolerance of in terms of pressure and, uh, and uh, lipid levels. And patients were randomly assigned to standard care or use of the polypill. Uh, and the intent was to demonstrate that there would be better adherence and that it would be at least non-inferior to usual care. What the uh, investigators found is that not only was it non-inferior, but when one looked at a primary composite endpoint of CVDS, MI, stroke, or urgent revascularization, there was actually a reduction in, in, that, in the risk for that with the polypill compared to usual care. And even if one focused on a more conventional, maybe harder triple composite endpoint of CVDS and mind stroke, there was also more than a 20% reduction uh, with uh, the polypill compared to control. So there was actually benefit and substantial benefit of uh, that treatment compared to control. And I think that is really important in addition to the um, convenience benefits and the adherence benefits uh, of that regimen. It's somewhat even unexpected to, to see the magnitude of that benefit on clinical outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I, I share your interpretation and enthusiasm. And, you know, cardiovascular death was also lower. I, I thought it was a home run. But maybe, Paul, you could just give us your top line impression of that one. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it has really shown improved adherence. I would say a couple of things. The first, if I was designing that polypill today, I might not put a torvastatin 20 milligrams into it, but 40 or 80, because these are post-MI patients that have high-risk features. And secondly, I found it very intriguing that there was actually not a significant difference in LDL achieved, as well as blood pressure achieved. And yet, there appeared to be a difference in MACE outcomes, as you point out, professors, uh, Steg. So it's just very interesting, I think, that the mechanism of improved adherence could be working through many different ways. Yeah, no, there could be multiple mechanisms at play. And of course, there's potential better adherence to the antiplatelet therapy part of the polypill, where biomarkers wouldn't capture that. But at any rate, I, I think a practice changing trial. Uh, so, Paul, let's stick with you. The Intrigue trial, I, I presented a phase two trial. Do you want to? quickly recap what that was and what your thoughts were. I haven't spoken to you about it, so I'd be interested to hear what you thought. Very interesting study, Deepak, and I congratulate you on the results of it. So this was a phase two trial of a fibroblast growth factor 21 analog. And we know that FGF21 is actually involved. It's a stress hormone that regulates lipid metabolism and glucose metabolism. So it does a lot of different things, not just working on triglycerides, but working on you know, many different metabolic parameters. So this study looked at a patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia and looked at this FGF21 analog um, to see whether it could actually change their triglycerides and improve their metabolic parameters. Uh, now, we know that this FGF21 analog not only improved the action of the native molecule, but it also itself had physiologic action. So patients with triglycerides between 500 and 2000, actually the average triglycerides in this population was 733, uh, about 50% diabetics, and 45% on background statin therapy, some on fibrates, some on omega-3s, with a median LDL of 89. 
And what we saw was actually quite dramatic. So, you know, there were many different doses of the drug that were studied, but we saw in the pool drug, there was a 45% reduction in triglycerides uh, with the reduction going up as high as 63%. We also saw improvement in insulin sensitivity. We saw that many people, about 18% of patients in the trial actually normalized their triglycerides. And we saw some modest effects on some other lipid parameters as well. We saw a reduction of non-HDL by 20 to 30%, ApoB by 10 to 20%. But perhaps what I was most impressed by was that there was actually reduction in liver fat by 40% based on imaging parameters. So I feel like this drug obviously is going to have phase three trials, but it's something that I could certainly see myself using in clinical practice to treat not only those triglycerides, but all of these other parameters, which we're learning, can actually really impact outcomes as well. Yeah, I've got to say the steering committee was pretty excited. Uh, we we're going blind to the results. Uh, Gabriel, what about the time trial? That was one that was highly anticipated. Do you want to provide a quick recap of what that was? Yeah, so treatment of hypertension, of course, is a major medical issue and a major public health issue. And we know patients are not always optimally treated. Uh, but a simple question has emerged over the past few years, which is, should we give treatment in the morning or should we give treatment in the evening when patients are taking monotherapy? And one of the reasons for this is that there have been some studies, in particular, there's been one trial that has claimed that there is a very substantial difference in the clinical outcomes when patients are taking antihypertensive medication in the evening as compared to the morning. That was an expected and really deserved uh, confirmation or uh, uh, at least verification. And uh, the time trial is another example of how our British colleagues are teaching us to do large scale, simple trials to provide very clear and robust answers to simple questions. And so the NHS did a trial of more than 21,000 patients randomized across the entire country and followed up for more than five years, uh, the longest follow-up being nine years. And I'll make a long story short. There is absolutely no difference in outcomes, none of the outcomes, the primary composite outcome and the individual outcomes in whether pills are taken in the morning or in the evening. And I actually think this is great news for patients because we don't have to worry about this. They can have whatever is most convenient for them, whatever way and time of treatment will uh, ensure that they have the best adherence uh, to treatment. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, a really definitive answer to a common clinical question. Uh, Paul, maybe you can wrap it up with a update on the reduced trial analysis that was presented here. Uh, Gabriel and I are both on the executive committee, so why don't you give us your impression of the data? Yes, thank you. Um, and congratulations again to both of you, because obviously the parent trial was such a practice changing trial, but now we continue to see these sub studies and analyses of specific populations also really guide our clinical practice. So, you know, this was a sub study looking at, at the MI patients within Reduce It. Um, and Reduce It, if you recall, was a randomized trial of patients with ASCVD or diabetes plus an additional risk factor. Uh, randomized to get IPE four grams a day versus placebo. And what we saw in this study was that the overall MIs were reduced by 31%. And we saw the benefit as early as 26 months um, after treatment. And this was really, to me, very interesting because it changed both all types of MIs across the board, whether they were STEMIs or NSTEMIs. They actually even changed cabbage-related MIs, PCI-related MIs. And I, what I found most provocative was that it actually changed the size of the MI as well and had an impact on, you know, causing slower, uh, smaller, excuse me, MIs. So to me, I think we had data last year from the ESC that showed us that reduce it can affect plaque morphology. And I'm starting to wonder whether it's not just altering the plaque, but also the myocardium and the reaction and interaction of the, the endothelium with the myocardium and how it works. So very good news, obviously coming on the heels of a biomarker study that just came out with reduce it that raised some questions about the trial, but to me, this is more reassurance in, in that I'm not just saving lives, but I'm also reducing cardiovascular MIs. Terrific. Well, those were four trials that were presented here on day one. There was other good stuff as well. I really thought the meeting has been packed with important new information. Join us again for the day two wrap-up.